you go. Thank you. Okay, lucky last. Thank you very much for sticking around. Um, we'll jump straight into it. We're talking about using co-design uh, to create more effective monitoring programs. So my name's David Mossop. I um, coordinate our citizen science program at the EPA in Victoria. Um, and I'd like to point out all the people that contributed. So really quickly, we've heard some of these terms like this uh, plenty, of, plenty of times this week. Co-design, this is one um, definition. It's from Wikipedia, but I think it actually captured some of the essence of it. So you've got actively involving all stakeholders. You're talking about the design process. So looking at often the start, there's an asterisk on that though. Design can, we found, happen uh, throughout the longer project lifetime. And you're trying to create a result that meets the needs of the stakeholders and is actually usable. A few key ingredients. You can see them up there. A couple I wanted to highlight. The third one there, having energy and time and a level of flexibility. So what we were finding was people that come into this process have got very different starting points. And you need to be able to be flexible and, and have that time to actually do it properly, take them through and actually work within their limitations as well. And the last one, this whole thing doesn't work if you don't actually have a commitment to follow through. Um, it's really important. And, I, and for me, that's not just a commitment from us as people that are creating and facilitating our projects, but actually the organisation behind you. And monitoring. Um, we all probably know what it is. It could be anything. But here's a definition again. Looking at a time series of measurements to answer questions about change. It could be a microplastic um, survey on beach that you're conducting. I have a personal interest in freshwater crayfish, so I love them. You could be monitoring those. And a few characteristics of what makes an effective monitoring program. I've pulled out three here, and I think that there's a lot of them out there, but these three really link in nicely, I think, with co-design and citizen science. First of all, having a holistic understanding of your topic and the design behind it, so you're looking at your problems and solutions. Having that spatial coverage, of um, including access to land, is actually quite critically important. And I'm sorry, Margot, I'll put your face out there. <laughs> but you taught me that 80% of Australia is privately owned, and that's a really significant number if you're thinking about doing a monitoring program. And actually having an engaged and supportive community. For me, this is really about actually modern science. It's done a lot more in the public sphere. Um, this, this whole conference is a perfect example of that. And we really need to, to think about that more, I think, and delivering programs that do have community involved and supportive. Just a really quick one. You might have seen this graphic through Tess Hayes' work. Um, this is a little bit of a model that we've created at, at EPA that's been working well for us. So we're talking about that design phase. And the point here is that it could be at the start of this, so you can go through your other co's, or it can be a standalone process. And we're going to have a look at two case studies, one of each of those. First of those is Tess's project, uh, Caring for Waterhole Creek. So um, both these case studies are over in the Latrobe Valley. Uh, so this is about two, two and a half hours east of Melbourne. Um, that's where a lot of our power generation happens, so coal mine um, power plants. This was a nine-month water quality monitoring project. And I've just put out a few characteristics of I guess, what the style of this co-design was. It was about we were working with a small group. And we actually started off with having our scientists, our freshwater experts, establish um, a study design. And then we had citizen science fine-tune things. And a really important thing that we found in this space is actually having something like a remit like this. And you're clearly stating um, the scope of the work that we're asking people to involve in. In practice, it doesn't have to be as rigid and government speaky like this, but it's the way you communicate it. And then, like I said before, having that commitment behind it. So in this instance, we committed to um, providing that draft study design and consulting and working with our citizen scientists to get to that final product and then implementing it. So these are the areas that they um, helped us out with. So some of the spatial design, some of those parameters that we're measuring. Um, frequency, obviously, is pretty important um, for them to actually have this buy-in early and with the view that this will flow into the rest of that program. And the key one there that we found was that local knowledge. 
and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that was critical to this project. Second case study. So we did a um, project looking at co-designing the new Latrobe Valley Air Monitoring Network. Um, and for this, you might have heard this term, environmental justice. I'm not going to go too far into it, but this is getting into this sport sort of space, and Karen Cooper had covered this um, earlier this week. And the design for this project was um, looking at a large, diverse group um, and building this approach up from the ground up. So we're looking at a bit more bottom-up style. And just to go back a step with the environmental justice angle, the little bit of background to this is that uh, Latrobe Valley, like I said, has been the area where we do a lot of power generation. And they were also um, uh, subject to a large mine fire in the area. So that was in early 2014. Big coal mine fire. Um, it was going for about six weeks and really affected the local community with smoke and ash fallout. Back to the group, 36 um, community panel members. So we had a range of people involved. We also had EPA and non-EPA scientists. It was critical actually to have the non-EPA scientists because in this space there was actually some trust issues. Um, so to have that external opinion was, was actually really handy. We had an external facilitator and also some of our own staff to help manage the event or events. Uh, again, starting with the remit. So we're setting the scope and expectations of people and having a commitment. Now, this, the, the, the first case study I showed you was a, a fairly small scale project. This is actually really a significant moment for EPA and Victorian government. We were, for the first time, putting real decision making power into the hands of community and coming out with a really um, wonderful result.